So tonight we are in Philippians chapter 1. We started two weeks ago with the first passage and we did a bit of an introduction. And uh, if you weren't able to be here, I hope you had a chance to maybe go online and watch the video, but you can certainly catch up on that at, at any time. Um, we noted a couple of things about Philippians as far as the fact that it's a really joy-filled letter, and that's one of the themes. There are other themes that we mentioned. I'll just uh, remind you of those quickly. We see the theme of unity within this letter of Philippians. We see Christ emphasized, uh, joy, as I mentioned, uh, fellowship and partnership. It's there mentioned many times in the book, as well as suffering and uh, thinking or the mind, the Christian mind. So these are things we're going to see pop up, and we may notice a few more themes as we go along the way. But tonight, our focus is verses 12 through 26, 12 through 26 of chapter 1. You know, part of the purpose of our community Bible study is to help us all become better students of the Word, to be able to handle it better on our own, not just to look to your pastors or Sunday school teachers to teach you, but that you might notice these things in the text as well. And uh, part of that we've talked about, especially with, um, with the letters or the epistles of the New Testament, is structure. We've talked about that before. So we're going to notice some things with the structure tonight and try to just work our way through it. But uh, let's begin, of course, by reading the passage, and then we will pray. So Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body." whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we are so grateful that we can come together and study your word and to be encouraged by this joy-filled letter, the letter of Philippians. And we pray that now we would be able to focus our minds uh, on the text of your word and that we would have greater understanding and that it wouldn't just uh, be mental head knowledge, Lord, but that it would impact how we live that we would be more faithful to you, that we would love you more, and out of that love would grow a, an even greater obedience to you. We thank you for this time together in your word, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder if you happen to notice any uh, repetition in the passage as we were reading. Um, there are a few things that are repeated, and we'll notice that. I want to ask you about that before we just start walking through the text. I want to point out a few things uh, to you as far as the structure. We've talked about that with the letters of Paul. Uh, the structure matters. We don't want to camp out on uh, a little thing that Paul isn't trying to make the big thing. We don't want to major on the minors or vice versa. So did you happen to notice any repeated words, ideas, themes? Uh -huh. I. Wow, now that's just, that's just showing off right there. That's, that's true. The letter, Paul speaking personally, saying I. Yep, that's in there. Anything else? Exactly, yep. So it's a very personal passage because he keeps referring to himself as I. He's telling you information about what's going on in his life. It's a very introspective in one sense, but it's not just background info on Paul. It does matter, and it points ultimately to Christ. Exactly. Exactly. 
rejoicing and joy. Yep, they're in there at least twice, maybe more. Some people know that he's not ashamed of Christ. He's not ashamed, yep. Live, live. so he's emphasizing how he will uh, live and, and the question of whether he'll live or die. What is uh, Paul's current state? What, where is he at? What's he got going on right now? He's in jail. How, what tipped you off to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so even right here, he talks about chains or imprisonment, depending on your translation. Uh, at least three times there. You look at the end of uh, verse 13, he talks about that his imprisonment is for Christ. Verse 14, he mentions that again, imprisonment or, or chains. And again, at the end of verse 17. So if we weren't sure before now, it's very clear, Paul currently, as he is writing this, he is in chains. He's imprisoned. You'll also notice um, about midway through there, he, there's a repetition not of words necessarily, but of the idea of preaching, of proclamation. So in verse 14, he talks about um, the brothers and sisters being much more bold to speak the word without fear. And then he'll kind of uh, explore that more in 15 through 18 about preaching. He says, some indeed preach Christ. 17, the former proclaim Christ. And in verse 18, uh, what then only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. So even just as you read, and we, we emphasize to you often to be reading the text uh, repeatedly, you'll learn so much just by reading it again and again and again. Uh, that helps you. It sets you up to know, okay, so here's some of the emphases that are going on. So if you have a question about one point, it doesn't mean the question doesn't matter, but it helps keep you on the right track <clears throat> from falling off into one of the, the ditch on either side to emphasize the wrong thing or perhaps to misunderstand the passage. One other thing I want to point out to you that uh, depending on your translation, it may, it may not come through. It doesn't really come through in the one I just read to you. Um, but there are, are bookends here in, in this passage that really uh, kind of set the theme for the, whole, for the whole section here. He talks about the advance of the gospel. Uh, depending on your, your Bible, again, it may even tell you. I think the, the scripture journal that Russell has, the ESV, that's the heading for this whole section is the advance of the gospel. And that's, that's really true, but uh, verse 12 talks about that phrase, the advance of the gospel. But then down in verse 25, uh, it talks about the progress, the progress and joy in the faith. It would be really helpful if they had translated that word consistently because it's the same word in Greek. So at the beginning and end of this section, it's all about the advance the advance of the gospel. And that helps us frame what we're going to be thinking about. So all of that, with all that in mind, we begin actually discussing, discussing the text. Paul says there in verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, Paul, clearly, he's trying to give them an update. Perhaps they've already heard some information. Maybe they already know that he's in jail. But he, he's very clearly saying, I want you to know something, brothers and sisters. And he says that what has happened to me, and, and so you would expect him to start telling you what has happened to him. You would really expect more details. We already know that he's uh, imprisoned. He's in chains. We've talked about that. We see it there in the text. But think about how different this report from Paul is from, from anything that we would have today. If you have somebody, whether it's a family member or a famous pastor, if somebody's in jail, you got all sorts of questions. You want to know, uh, how are they doing? How's their health? What happened to get them in, the, in jail in the first place? When's their trial date? Uh, what kind of diet are they on? How are the guards? How hard is the cot? All those sorts of things. We could get all that on the news. We could get all this information about what it's like in jail. And Paul, uh, he seems like he's, he's about to let you know that. And uh, you don't fully get that information that you might expect for them to give you. So he, um, you would expect him to start talking about what has happened to him. You'd expect specific details, but that's not what he gives us at all. But he does say, what has happened to me has, has really served to advance the gospel. He's saying what's happened to me has, has actually, it's, it's somewhat unexpected. This is not how you thought this was going to turn out. But this uh, detour of going to prison has actually been a blessing. It served to advance the gospel. Instead of hindering the gospel, instead of hindering the work that Paul is doing, this is actually advancing the gospel. It hasn't hurt. It has actually helped. One, one writer has talked about how this has gone from chains into chants. 
Now, we wouldn't think of it that way. If we got arrested uh, tonight on the way home for the sake of Christ, if you went through a roadblock and they said, are you a Christian? And you said, yes. And they said, all right, you're going to jail. You would think your world has turned upside down. None of us, myself included, we wouldn't begin. Our first thought would not be, oh, maybe the Lord has somebody I need to witness to in jail. Maybe the Lord is about to break out great revival in our city because of me going to jail. But Paul says him being imprisoned has actually served to advance the gospel, to move the gospel forward. That, that idea of advancing, you, you probably hear it in English. You start thinking about military, the army advancing. You think about famous battles and, and all it takes to advance in this type of, of war, of battle. And Paul is saying the gospel is advancing even though he's in chains. Now, this really shouldn't surprise us. We understand that the gospel is living and active. It's sharper than two, any two-edged sword. It is dynamic. The word is alive. And so we shouldn't be shocked uh, that the word of God works in this way, that the gospel works this way. As we're going through the gospel of Matthew, what was it? Two Sundays ago, Pastor Laramie at the end of chapter 4 pointed out how Jesus went all about all these different places. He's preaching uh, the gospel of the kingdom. And then at the end of Matthew's gospel, we already know how it ends. Jesus tells us to go and preach the gospel to all nations. So he's expecting the gospel to go forth just as he himself has already taken the gospel forth. Then you go into Acts and the, the letters of the New Testament, and we see the gospel at work. I love the way uh, Paul talks about the Thessalonian church. We studied that a, a year or two ago and how the Thessalonian church, the gospel sounded forth. It trumpeted forth. The gospel flourished among the Thessalonians. And so we really shouldn't be surprised. We should expect the advance of the gospel. But let's be honest, this is not what Paul thinks that his readers, the Philippians that he loves so dearly, they wouldn't expect that this to, would be a blessing. They would expect that this imprisonment would hinder the gospel rather than advancing it. So he begins by saying, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And then at the beginning of verse 13, two little words, so that. He's letting you know a result. Because uh, this imprisonment has served to advance the gospel, what has happened to him has served to advance the gospel, so that we should be looking for results. Here's the results that he says. He tells us that there's progress, there's advance in the gospel with unbelievers, and then we'll see there's advance of the gospel with believers. So there in verse 13, it's a, a progress or an advance of the gospel with unbelievers. Verse 13, he says, So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Well, who are the whole imperial guard? Uh, depending on your translation, maybe the King James just says praetorium, the praetorian guard. They just take that word from Greek and bring it right over into English. The praetorian guard were an elite group of soldiers that were tasked with protecting the Caesar. And that force could uh, number up to 9,000 soldiers. So this isn't some small group. It's a large group of people. And the Praetorian was originally associated with the, the place, the palace, where that protection was going on. But then you could talk about the, the soldiers there. So it says the Im Imperial Guard, the Praetorian Guard. These are special forces here. And clearly Paul is having some interaction with them. Why? Because he's in jail. He's imprisoned. And so he's being guarded by some of these soldiers and not only are they hearing about why he's in jail, but it says also to all the rest. It seems like Paul is being housed perhaps even at Caesar's palace. We don't fully know the details of all of it, but later in, uh, at the end of the letter when Paul says, you know, the church here sends you greetings, especially those of Caesar's household. And so there are people who are hearing the gospel who would never have heard it had Paul not been imprisoned and put into chains. And so they're hearing about it. It's become known to them throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that his imprisonment, literally his chains, are for Christ. Now think about that. We, we know all of that to be true. We studied 2 Timothy in the fall and we saw Paul in prison at that point. And so we, we're not really shocked when he says my imprisonment is for Christ. But imagine if you were one of those soldiers guarding Paul. They hear people every day try to explain to them why they shouldn't be in jail. Think about it. You ask somebody, what are you in for? I was framed. I didn't do it. Judge Russell here will tell you they always have an excuse. It's never their fault. They shouldn't be here. But Paul has a legitimate reason. The reason he's in jail is for Christ. 
It's not for crime. It's not for sins that he has done. He's imprisoned. He's in chains for Christ. And so every day as Paul uh, gets a new set of guards around him, every four hours they start to hear, whether they want to hear or not, they've got to listen to this prisoner that they're chained to, and they hear all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is he in prison? It is for Christ. And so there's progress with unbelievers. These people like the imperial guard and all the rest, they're hearing the gospel. The gospel is advancing uh, in a way that it wouldn't have had Paul not been imprisoned. But uh, verse 14 tells us that not only is the gospel advancing with unbelievers, it's also advancing or making progress with believers. Verse 14 says, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So most of the Roman church there, when they hear about Paul's imprisonment and they see God at work in the life of Paul, even in the midst of him being arrested, they become confident. Not confident in Paul. Notice it says confident in the Lord. They're confident in the Lord because of Paul's imprisonment, because of his chains. And so this idea of being confident is to be so convinced, so persuaded of something as to put your, your trust, your action into something. And so because they see Paul uh, flourishing, even in prison, they see the gospel at work, even in the midst of his chains, they become much more bold to speak the word of God without fear. Think of it. They're saying to themselves, if God can bless the imprisonment of Paul, he can bless our preaching. He can bless our evangelism. If God can work even through Paul being in prison, then he can certainly be at work even while we're in freedom. And so as they become confident in the Lord by his imprisonment, they're much more bold, more bold than they previously had been. It doesn't mean that they weren't being evangelistic before then. It doesn't mean they weren't being faithful before that day, but they become much more bold to speak the word without fear. Whatever is in mind there is speaking the word. It's broad enough to imagine the idea of preaching. It's broad enough to include personal evangelism. It's, it's broad enough to include uh, what we would call um, public air, open air preaching or street corner preaching. All of that is in view here. They become much more bold to speak the word without fear. I'm reminded of, again, of our study of 2 Timothy. Do you remember what he said when he was in chains there in the last letter of his life? He said, even though uh, I am in chains, the gospel is not in chains. I am bound, but the gospel is not bound. I've been struck as we've been studying Philippians and just noticing the parallels, the same attitude that characterizes Paul at the end of his life is already present here throughout his ministry. We don't necessarily have a timeline of when exactly this happened or how far apart Philippians and 2 Timothy are. But the things that struck us so much about 2 Timothy, Paul already has these attitudes here in Philippians, especially this idea that the Word of God is not bound. And so as other Christians, as brothers and sisters there in Rome, as they're seeing uh, God at work through his imprisonment, uh, they are made much more bold to speak the Word without fear. I think about... Um, if some of you got to watch The Essential Church with us back in November, um, we saw the, the documentary focusing on the story of John MacArthur and James Coates and Tim Stevens. Tim Stevens and James Coates are pastors up in Canada, and they were arrested and imprisoned in Canada for uh, keeping their churches open during the COVID lockdown because Canada had far overreaching uh, policies, and so they were targeting the church. And so these men said, no, the, the church belongs to Christ. It doesn't belong to Caesar. We're going to keep our doors open. And so they were arrested for that. John MacArthur in California, uh, not arrested, but had that threat of arrest. And there were many threats of fines and all that stuff. And uh, if you didn't get a chance to watch that, you're welcome. We'd love to let you borrow that and see that. But it was very encouraging. It was fortifying for a lot of pastors. I'm grateful that I didn't have to make the decisions that they made during those days. Number one, I wasn't here as your pastor yet. By the time I came in December of 2020, that first wave of all that stuff had already passed. Secondly, we're in the state of Georgia, not the state of California. So we didn't have a lot of the decisions to make here that they had to make there, praise God. But for a lot of pastors, we'd never had thought about those things before. We'd always been taught to defer to government, to, uh, to be honorable, and, and really pretty much if, if we're told by an authority figure to do something, to do it. Uh, and this whole process uh, of COVID and all the aftermath of that caused 
pastors to start to think carefully about what does the Bible really say about authority and this idea of rendering to God what is God and to Caesar's what is Caesar's. And uh, so it's fortified us, it's fortified me in a way of watching these men uh, and learning from that so that when that day comes again, not if, but when that time comes again, hopefully I'll make a wiser decision than perhaps I would have in the summer of 2020. I think about that with this verse here, that we're much more bold because we have become confident in the Lord even by their imprisonment. Well, he mentions that idea of preaching there at the end of verse 14 of speaking the word without fear. But verses 15 through 18 let you know that, yeah, there's a lot of proclamation going on, but it's not all with the same motive. It's not all with the same motive. So verse 15, he says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from good will. Can you imagine that? He says, to be sure, there are some who are actually speaking the word. They're proclaiming Christ from envy and rivalry. Now, we understand envy. We probably automatically think jealousy or something like that. But you understand you can be envious or jealous and that just be internal and you don't actually act upon it. But the idea here is that they're actually being active. They're acting upon this envy and this jealousy. It's the same thing that you see in Matthew 27 when you see the religious leaders uh, are so envious of Christ that they hand him over uh, to be crucified. It's not just that they sit back and they wag their tongues and they complain. They were so hateful and so jealous of Christ that they indeed wanted to see him crucified and died. So some are preaching Christ from envy and rivalry, an idea of factions and divisions. Those of you in Russell's class, you're going through 1 Corinthians and you've seen that. Uh, as Paul addresses that issue in the Corinthian church, how deadly it can be when uh, that type of division, that rivalry comes into the church. And that would certainly undermine and destroy the unity of the church. One of the big themes of the letter is the unity that we have in Christ, the unity that the Philippians have. And so envy and rivalry would work to undermine that and destroy that. So he says there are some people, to be sure, that are preaching Christ from, from envy and rivalry, but others are doing it from goodwill. He clarifies, verse 16, the latter do it out of love, out of love, which is the, the hallmark Christian virtue. When you think of Christians, you're supposed to think of love. We certainly fall short of that, but that's what Christ has told us to do. He said in John 13, By this will the world know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you think about 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, as we so famously call it, if Christians are to be known for anything, it's to be loving. And so he says, the latter, those who are preaching the gospel from goodwill, the latter do it out of love because they know that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. He's saying that I'm put here, I have been appointed for the defense of the gospel. Like a soldier has been assigned to his post and he's supposed to stay there and do his task until his post ends. That's what Paul is saying here. He's been destined, he's been appointed here for the defense of the gospel. Verse 17, and by the way, for those of you who are in the uh, the King James or the New King James, verses 16 and 17, the word order in those verses are different than what I have in the ESV. I've never noticed it that way before. Most of the time, whatever 16 says in one translation, it says in another translation. But here, 16 and 17, it'll, it'll make your head spin a little bit if you're trying to get the word order. So I know some of you are looking at that. Just bear with me. It's all there. If you want to learn the Greek and translate it, I'll, I'll be glad to help you try to figure that out. But that's, that's what's going on. What did you say? I know. And when I was studying that, it kept throwing me off because something I was reading was referencing the New King James. I was like, wait a minute, something is not, not right. So that's, it's all the same words in Greek. They just translated it in a different order there. But verse 17 here with the ESV, the, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So again, you've, you've got another group of people, they're still proclaiming Christ, but these people, the, the ones who are doing it out of envy and rivalry, they're also doing it out of selfish ambition. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Philippians, you may remember that not too far from here, and we'll see it in two weeks in chapter 2, verse 3, he's going to tell the Philippians to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But here, that's exactly what these uh, troublemakers are doing. They're not false teachers, as we'll discuss in just a moment. They're preaching Christ, they're proclaiming Christ, but they're doing it out of selfish ambition. The, the idea behind it is ladder climbing. I don't know if, uh, what line of work you come from, and maybe you see it in your line of work, 
But sadly, preachers are known for ladder climbing. You've seen that probably in different pastors you've known, maybe not here, but at other churches. You have friends at other churches and you see. Uh, it, it starts in seminary and it's very disappointing when you see it in seminary because you can tell people who are going to be ladder climbers. They're going to take a position for a while until you climb to the next position, to the next position. Now, if you're doing that on the job, if you're doing that down at the plant, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You're, you're working to get a better job, to get better pay, all that sort of stuff. But the work of ministry is not the same. And so far too often, I've seen friends who started out the same time as I did. They're on like the third or fourth church. And I'm thinking, I, I don't think God called you to do that. Uh, that. That's just not the way he seems to work when you look at pastoral ministry in the scriptures here. They're ladder climbing. That seems to be what's going on here. It's important for us to see that because these people who are preaching Christ from envy and rivalry, they're not preaching a false gospel. In fact, the idea really seems to be that not as much as what we automatically think of of preaching, but the fact that there's public discussion about this man, Paul. There's discussion about Paul. Again, the, the soldiers are discussing him. It seems like everybody's discussing Paul. And some people are saying, yeah, he's there for Jesus the Messiah, and we support Paul. And others are saying, uh, yeah, he's there for Jesus the Messiah, and we disagree with Paul. And if we can put Paul down, then we can climb the ladder and advance further up and have better social status than, than Paul currently has. And so they're both proclaiming the Messiah. They're both pointing to Jesus Christ, but they're doing it for different reasons. And so the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but they're thinking to afflict him, afflict me in my imprisonment, he says, afflict him in his chains. You can imagine the tongues wagging. They're saying, oh, Paul, you must be under the judgment of God. After all, why else would you be in jail? Look at us, Paul. We're out here preaching the Messiah. We're out here preaching the same message you are, but we're not in jail. Paul, you must have done something wrong. You must, have, you must be under the judgment of God. Because we all fall into that prosperity thinking where if everything's going well in life, then we must have the favor of God on us. And if things are going poorly in life right now, then we must have the judgment of God upon us. Let, let's be honest. If that were true, almost everybody we know is under the judgment of God right now. How many of our own church are going through difficult circumstances right now? Whether it's family strife or whether it's uh, health issues, all sorts of things going on. If that were what the Bible actually taught, we would all be in trouble. But Paul knows that's not true. That's not how it works. But yet, you know that there's the temptation to believe that. When you're there in prison, you're, you're caught between the two soldiers, you're in chains. Paul certainly would have had that temptation to believe that at times, that God uh, was not pleased with him. That's what these ladder climbers seem to be saying. They're proclaiming Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict him in his imprisonment. Well, he seems to come here to verse 18, the kind of the climax, the, the middle part of this whole section between 12 and 26. And he says, what then? That, that phrase seems to signal the conclusion of this line of thought. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. You see, there's one group of people who are hoping they can turn the political tide. Maybe they can even influence the judge. Maybe they can influence the jury and say, this guy, Paul, oh no, he needs to be, uh, he needs to be uh, sentenced. He needs to be found guilty. He needs to be dealt with as a political prisoner. But the rest of us, oh, we're preaching Christ, and so uh, don't judge us all by Paul. Some are hoping for the worst for Paul. Others are, are praying for the best. But Paul says only that in every way, in every manner, no matter how they're preaching the Messiah, as long as they're preaching the Messiah, whether in pretense, in sincerity, or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. We're probably familiar with this passage. Philippians is a very familiar letter. We hear it quoted all the time. If you've been in church any length of time, I know this isn't the first Bible study on Philippians you've ever been a part of. But pause and think about what Paul is saying. He's not saying everything's fine. He's not saying, oh, it doesn't matter that I'm being mistreated. But think about all that he's gone through. He's been misrepresented. He's been misunderstood. He's been mistreated. But he's ultimately saying that his situation is not the center of the universe. How foreign is that way of thinking even to us as Christians? Because whatever we're going through, we filter our circumstances as the center of our universe. We may be mature enough to recognize that my situation is not the center of your universe, but I would certainly say what I've got going on is the center of my own universe. But Paul says, no, what he's going through, ultimately, the gospel 
is at the center of his universe. Ultimately, it's not what happens to Paul, but it's what Christ is doing. The gospel is advancing, and in that he rejoices. After all, this is the same man that wrote Romans 8, 28, that we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called by God, called according to his purpose. And the Old Testament equivalent of that, of, of Joseph speaking to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50, saying, what you meant for evil against me, God meant it for good. This is a biblical truth, and we, we take comfort in those passages, but sometimes we wonder, what does it look like being played out in real life? This is what it looks like being played out in real life. This is written from a man sitting in prison. He's in chains. He doesn't know for a fact that he's going to be released. He's not sure how all of this is going to turn out. Ultimately, he's rejoicing in the gospel going forth, the advance of the good news of Jesus Christ. Any thoughts or questions so far on what we've seen? I think also about the passage in, at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It'll be a while before you all get there. But um, Paul says there's an open door for ministry. He calls the name of the place where he's going to be. There's an open door for ministry there, but there are many enemies. And I notice that often uh, when, I'll blame preachers. Preachers, we want to baptize our good ideas with Bible verses. And we think we've thought of something smart. And so therefore we're going to slap a Bible verse on it to make everybody else in the church feel like they have to go through with it. And so we'll say, oh, there's an open door for ministry. But most preachers don't point out the part where Paul says there are many enemies. When we see enemies to the gospel, we assume, oh, that must be a closed door. God doesn't want me to go over there because that's got to be a closed door. It's going to be difficult, so that can't be what God wants. God wouldn't want us to go through something difficult. He wouldn't want us to face enemies, so that, that can't be what God has in mind. But no, Paul knew in Corinth that God had an open door for ministry, even though there was much difficulty there. And Paul knows that God is doing a great work. There's a great advancement of the gospel, even though he's sitting in prison. After all, if for no other reason than the books of Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians, and the letter of Philemon, we probably wouldn't have those letters if Paul were not in prison. That's when he wrote all four of these is the same time period of being in chains. So God is doing a great work. He's advancing the gospel even in the midst of a very difficult circumstance. Well, that's the first half of, of this section here, and he transitions right in the middle of verse 18. And he says, yes, and I will rejoice. So now he said that in the past he has rejoiced. He knows the gospel is being proclaimed, and so in that I rejoice. But now he says, yes, and I will rejoice. He's making an intentional choice. That's one of the big reasons why there's a difference in joy and happiness. We know that happiness is fleeting. Happiness is based on our circumstances. We may feel happy at the least suspected times, but joy is an, an action. It's something that we choose. We tell ourselves to have joy. Paul is going to make, command the Philippians in this letter to rejoice, to have joy. If you're being commanded to do it, then that means you're, you're able to do it. And so he's making this intentional choice. That's a critical truth for Christians to, to remember that we can force ourselves to rejoice. We can rejoice even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Even when everything's not going the way that we think they should go, he says, I will rejoice. Verse 19, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now we saw at the beginning of the chapter, Paul talked about how he had been praying for them. We saw that all the way through verses 3 through 11. Paul is, is often praying for the Philippians. But now he's asking them to pray for him. He knows that they are praying for him, and because of their prayers, he knows that this will turn out for his deliverance. But it's not just their prayers alone. He says also the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in the Apostle Paul. He knows that. He also knows that the Philippian Christians are praying for him. And in that way, between the prayers of God's saints and the Spirit of God at work, in a way that we can't separate. I've got my fingers intermingled here. We can't separate the work of the Spirit and how He works through prayer. But through all of that, Paul knows that God will turn this out for His deliverance. His deliverance. Now the question before us is, does He mean His deliverance from jail? His deliverance from the executioner? The deliverance from this life permanently? Is He talking about deliverance, a spiritual deliverance or, or salvation? Your translation may sal say salvation and that's a very good way to translate that word as well. 
I think he's talking about ultimately not just the temporal, the here and now. He's talking about the last day. He's talking about his final deliverance, his final salvation. Part of that is because uh, I believe he's referring to, he's, he's kind of alluding to Job chapter 13, verse 19. Now, I didn't realize that. That's not in every commentary, depending on how your Bible is set off. Sometimes our Bibles kind of let you know, hey, this is an Old Testament reference. This isn't a direct quote like we've been seeing in Matthew, where Matthew talks so often about this took place so that the Scripture was fulfilled. It's just a little illusion. Paul, as a student of the Old Testament, he knows God's Word so well that it just, it just comes through. And he has a reference there to Job chapter 13, verse 19, where, where Paul, I mean, excuse me, where Job talks about this will turn out for my salvation. It's the same idea, the same phrase. And so Paul has confidence in this. He's seen God work in the past. He's seen God work in the Old Testament. He's seen God work in the life of Job. And ultimately, he knows this will turn out for his salvation, for his deliverance. He's quite confident in that. After all, he told us earlier in the letter, chapter 1, verse 6, that I'm sure of this, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So he's confident that the Lord will certainly deliver him. But it will be through the work of the Spirit in him. It will be through the prayers of the other believers. Verse 20, he keeps going. He says, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but with that full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my life, whether by life or by death. He says it's his, his eager expectation. It's his confident hope. It's the idea of, of someone standing on their tiptoes, craning their neck, looking ahead to try to see what's ahead. You don't do that unless you really want to know what's ahead. If you really don't care what's coming down the street, you don't exert that much energy. But if you're doing all that work to try to see what's coming, you have an anticipation. You really want to see what's going on. You have an eager expectation. Paul has a, a confidence, a hope, not the hope that what the way we use that word today, that we hope it'll finally stop raining or hope that it'll warm up or something like that. Our hope in scriptural terms is a confidence. It's an eager expectation that Paul says that I will not be at all ashamed. Now here's, here's another Old Testament reference perhaps from Psalm 34 verses 3 through 5. I won't read all of those for you, but you see here Paul talks about being ashamed and that Christ would be honored or magnified in his body. Those verses in Psalm 34 start and end with those same words of being ashamed and magnified. So here's a man that knows God's word so much it's just oozing out. He just keeps using scriptural language. But more than that, think about our connection with, with 2 Timothy. Maybe that comes more quickly to mind because we studied that together last fall. What is the connection with 2 Timothy that you hear in this, this phrase? Paul says here, I will not be at all ashamed. What did he keep telling Timothy over and over? Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Live a life unashamed. Paul, again, he already has these convictions rooted in his life. This is already part of who he is. It's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but with that full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored. Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Can you imagine that? He's saying that if I live, Christ will be honored. Christ will be magnified. If I'm living, I will be at work serving and honoring glorifying Christ. But even in my death, if that's what's next, then I will glorify, I will magnify the Lord in my body, whether by life or by death. And then verse 21, perhaps one of the, the most familiar verses here in the whole letter of Philippians, he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now you understand that we don't just rip that out of context. That's, that's expressing the idea that he's just said. He's talking about this confidence in the Lord. And he's knowing that the Lord will be honored or magnified in His body, whether by life or by death. And then He gives those, those simple words. Uh, you hear the, the beauty of them in English. They have the same rhythm and beauty in Greek. It says, to live, Christ. To die, gain. I don't know that I necessarily have to spend a lot of time trying to explain that, but I'm not sure that with a thousand lifetimes we would really begin to understand it the way that Paul has. I don't know that I've ever met anybody who has the same attitude that Paul has here. Um, as death approaches, and I understand that 
uh, based off of the, the insurance tables and stuff, I'm, I'm on one end of it, and some of you may be on a different end of it, but we know that we're not promised tomorrow. And I'm around death as a pastor, even though I may not have that prospect immediately in front of me. I'm not sure I've ran into anybody that has this attitude. If I live, I'll, I'll, I'll serve Christ. But if I die, I'll be with Christ. We don't normally think that way. We want to hang on as long as we can. We want to spend just another day with our kids, with our grandkids, with our wife, our husband. There, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But Paul is so consumed with Christ that whether he's living, he's going to be serving Christ. If he dies, he's going to be with Christ. You know I don't say that in any way to put a, a tension between those responsibilities that we have to family. That's a wonderful gift from God. But is Christ so high in our priorities that we would even begin to say something like this? For me, yes, ma'am. Mm. He feels like oh, he feels like he's trying to make up mm. for what it is that he did. Well, it's possible. I don't know if I'd put it in the language of making up, but he certainly sees the futility of everything that he's done in life. And he, he even talks about in Philippians and other letters, here's, here's my pedigree. Here's all the things that I had going for me. He says, I count that as waste. It's garbage. And so I don't know that he's, he's not trying to make up for anything in the sense of, of earning credit with God. But he knows how much all that counted for nothing. And that's what the world would elevate. He had it all by the world standards, and yet he didn't have Christ. And so with this, he knows that to live, he's going to be serving Christ, and, and Christ is in him. So Paul uses that language more than anybody else to describe our relationship. We, we say we're Christians. We're followers of Jesus. What does Paul say most often? He says, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. And so if he's living, he's in Christ. Christ is at work in him. Um, it's no longer he that lives, but Christ who lives in him. But if he dies, he's going to be with Christ, literally, like with him for all of eternity. So either way, he's, he's going to be fine. He's a winner either way, as the saying goes. But yeah, that's a wonderful thought of thinking back on. Paul does have a different perspective because of how many years he wasted. Um, people who, it, it's funny when you watch people compare testimonies, if you want to put it that way. Because if you're raised in a Christian home, uh, sometimes we take these things for granted. It's a blessing to grow up in a godly home. It's a blessing to go up, uh, to grow up in the church. It's a blessing to not have one of those those horrible testimonies that really makes everybody's jaw drop. Like it's it's a blessing to grow up in that environment. But if you're not careful, you'll take it all for granted. And somebody who has gone through all of that, they've seen sin horribly. They've seen sin up close. They often recognize the preciousness of salvation in a little bit different way than perhaps we do being raised in a godly home. It's not that either one of them are preferable. We want to serve Christ in whatever circumstance we found ourselves. But Paul certainly would have had a, a deep appreciation for his salvation because of how many years he, he wasted not serving Christ. So he goes on, he, he, he camps out on this idea of to live as Christ, to die as gain. He kind of walks out this decision uh, that he's kind of going through in his head almost as if he could choose. Now, Paul will tell us you can't choose when you're going to die. You can't choose the circumstances of how you're going to die. But he, he's kind of walking this decision out and letting the Philippians listen in. He says, if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Now, to be sure, just in case you're, you're wondering, because you hear Paul in other letters talk about the flesh, and that's usually not a good thing. In Galatians, it's not a good thing. In Romans, it's not a good thing. In 1 Corinthians, it's not a good thing. But here, he's not talking about a, a, a sinful life. He's just talking about life, to be alive. If he continues on, if he lives in the flesh, then that means fruitful labor for him. As long as he lives, he's going to continue serving Christ. He's going to continue seeking the advance of the gospel. But then he says, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. It's like he's really torn. He does, ultimately, he doesn't get to choose. But if he could, he's kind of torn. Verse 23, I'm hard-pressed between the two. It's a, it's a beautiful image of, imagine walking through a canyon, and you get to the point that it's so narrow, you can barely pass through, but you've got solid rock on either side. I mean, literally, between a rock and a hard place. That, that imagery of just being crushed, being hard-pressed between the two. He's really torn in this decision. He says his desire is to depart, to depart. And it's the idea of a, of a ship about to set sail. It's just about to depart. It's the same image that he uses at the end of 2 Timothy, his final letter. The time of my departure has come. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. Why is it far better? Not because he's suicidal, 
not because he's tired of this life, but it's far better to be with Christ. After all, he's going to tell us later in the letter, our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we belong. That's where home is. We're just strangers, pilgrims passing through here. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better, literally much more better. Now, that wouldn't work in your English class, but that's, that's what Paul is saying here. It's much more better to be with Christ. But, verse 24, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Notice here, if you know the flow of Philippians, if you've been reading along, which I encourage you, keep reading the whole book. It's not very long. You'll benefit from reading it. You know that in chapter 2, he's going to talk about humility. He's going to offer up Jesus as the ultimate example of humility. But right here, he's modeling humility for us. He says, if I could, if I could go be with Christ, that would be the best. That would be far better. But on your account, out of his deep, deep love for them, he knows that it's necessary to remain in the flesh. If, if you could imagine the scales and he's, he's weighing out or the pros and cons, if you're putting the pros and cons on the scale, that idea of his love for them, of serving them, is what tips the scales. He says it's more necessary to remain in the flesh. Verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress, that for your advance and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul began this section right there in the middle of verse 18 on this note of, of confidence. He's very confident, I will rejoice. I'm confident that the gospel is advancing and going forth. But then right here in the middle, he's, he's kind of had that, that decision-making of, well, whether I live or die, which way will I go? But then he ends here, verses 25 and 26, on this note of, of confidence, of conviction. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you. He knows that he's not going to die yet. And it's for their, their progress, their advance in the gospel. So remember the, the flow of what he said. At the beginning, verse 12, he talked about the advance of the gospel among unbelievers. He talked about the advance of the gospel among Christians. Now he's talking about the advance of the gospel specifically among the Philippians. For your progress, for your advance and your joy in the faith. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory, to boast in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Well, there's much more that be, could be said, but I think this ought to lead us into prayer and thinking about how uh, some of our attitudes we want to correct and, and to line up with God's Word. And we might need to pray, Lord, give me this attitude. With however many days that I have left, may I truly say with Paul to live as Christ and to die as gain. But we also desire to see the gospel advance among us. We want to see the gospel go forth throughout our community, throughout our town, even if it comes through difficult circumstances, even if it comes with, with jail, with difficulties, with, with health circumstances. We want to see the gospel go forth. Well, let's pray in that regard, and then if you have any questions, until the, the children come over, we'll sing with them before we're dismissed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for your word. We, we must acknowledge that it's convicting. None of us perfectly live up to this idea of, of being so confident in you, of, of loving you so much, of desiring to be with you so much. None of us could fully say that to live is Christ, to die is gain. But we want to. We want to have that attitude. And help us, Lord, to have that even on the, on the difficult days. Lord, we long to see the gospel advance among us. We pray that you would continue to do that. We know that you're at work. We pray that you would continue to do that. And we would uh, see the fruit of that just as Paul saw while he was sitting in prison. We thank you for the joy of studying your word, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.